As you cross the threshold of absolute darkness, you find yourself in a strange room. As you look behind you, back to where you came, there is nothing but a solid stone wall. At the center of the room stands a massive stone cauldron that is pulsating with color and energy. There are four smaller wells within this room, each guarded by a strange statue. The walls are lined with bookcases filled with what must be hundreds of tomes. The ceiling is angled and completely reflective. What would you like to do? Hey folks, welcome back to Black Magic Craft. Today I'm going to be doing something a little bit different. I spent over 100 episodes showing you guys how to build cool things to use in your game, but I spent very little time actually showing you how to implement and use those builds. So today I want to show you one of the really interesting rooms that I designed and used in my last session. This is the Beacon of Plenty and it's an encounter room, but there's no foes or enemies. It's a bit of a puzzle. There's threats and there are rewards. And essentially the party has to find a way to get out of it. And along the way, they could encounter some great benefits and also some great threats. The longer they work around this room and use it, the more chances there are for beneficial effects. And this room was designed specifically to give them a bit of a power up before a big boss fight that they likely couldn't survive otherwise. Of course, nothing in life comes easy or free. So there's that great dynamic risk of a threat or multiple threats along the way. The room setup is fairly simple. I just used a single square 12 by 12 dungeon tile. The party enters this room by descending a staircase. At the bottom of that staircase, I described a wall of infinite blackness that no light source, natural or magical, could illuminate. Eventually, they took the leap of faith and crossed that threshold. When they entered the room, behind them, the stairwell they had come down on was completely gone and it was just solid stone. And they found this room. In the center of it, is this summoning stone. And I made this in a previous episode, uh, number 114, I think, is that right? Yeah, 114. And this was a great way to actually use it. It's this big stone monolith uh, that is swirling with energy and color. The walls are lined with bookcases that are full, full of hundreds and hundreds of books, all that are dedicated to the various schools of magic. There's four smaller wells that I described as looking just black or void of color. And each one of those wells is flanked by a statue. The great thing about this room is that you can kind of use any sort of random bits you have around. This could just be a big stone. These wells could be cauldrons, whatever. The bookcases, I used these ones from one of the older uh, Mantic Trains crate sets that I had but also you could use homemade ones. I have a video about how to make bookcases or just use blocks, whatever. The statues, I use these cool illithid things that I got from Blanco, but you could use anything, even a simple sphere or box. The important thing is that you have something to represent these objects. The other interesting thing about this room is that the ceiling is pyramid shaped. It comes up to a point and that ceiling is completely reflective. It is a perfect mirror. As the party investigates this room, some of the things that they can uncover with good perception or investigation checks is that the books all have pages missing and those pages are apparently random. They just have pages that have been ripped out and there are some ashes on the floor that looked a bit like charred books. All of the books are dedicated to magic. They're not spell books, but they are dedicated to magic and they're all clearly defined by the separate schools of magic. Another thing they can realize is that the reflective mirror like ceiling is at a very particular angle that 
works out so that if a beam of light were to project straight up from one of these statues, it would hit that angle and be directed right into the center of this middle large well. The way this room works is actually fairly simple once the party figures out the basics of it. If they open one of these books and rip out a page and drop it in one of the four wells, they will come to life and start swirling with energy and the statues in front of them will click and open and a beacon of light will shoot up towards the ceiling and reflect back into the center well. And that well will create an effect that will target whoever dropped that page in. And that effect is essentially a spell out of the player's handbook that is in theme with the school of magic from which that page came from. If they drop in a page from a book about conjuration, a conjuration spell will be triggered, targeted at that character. If it's a book from the school of necromancy, same thing. It will trigger a necromancy spell targeted at that player or character. Now, what I did for this was I went through in my journal before the game and I chose four spells for each school of magic. I chose spells out of the player's handbook that were about the same level or slightly lower than my party. And I intentionally chose some spells that would have a positive effect on a character and some that would have a negative effect. Going more heavily on the positive. The tricky thing here is that a lot of the spells in the player's handbook as written don't quite work in this scenario where a thing would be casting it on a person but they would be getting the benefit of it. After choosing the spells that I thought would have interesting dynamic effects, I changed them slightly so that it made more sense in this scenario. I also changed the duration of the spells so that they didn't just last a minute but they would last for several hours long enough to be in effect when they exited this room finally and went to the final boss showdown. For example, if the spell was something that created tendrils of dark magic that's like an attack, the beacon in the middle would project that and target the creature. But if it was something like a bless spell or whatever, it would target that creature and it would go on to that creature character. It requires some manipulation and it is a bit difficult in some of the schools of magic to find spells that could be both positive and negative. Some of them were easy, like the school of necromancy. It was pretty easy to find some that had positive effects or negative effects, but some of them it was a little bit tricky, like divination. I couldn't find something that would have a negative effect. But that was okay because the fun thing about this room is that in the process of figuring out what's going on, the characters will start dropping these spells into these pools and random stuff will happen. And it's really fun because you make a list. I made four for each. So when a character did it, they roll a D4. I look at my list and then I would just open up the player's handbook and read out the spell name and start reading the effects of that spell. And I would slightly change it, like I said, to fit the scenario. After a while, the players will realize this is some sort of place where someone can harness the powers and effects of these spells without actually casting them. And they will realize that there is a chance of negative things happening or positive things happening. And the longer they do it, the more they'll realize that the effects overall seem to be beneficial, but there's always that little interesting dynamic risk. The goal here is for the players to realize that and start taking that risk to try to buff themselves as much as possible before unlocking the room and moving into the final boss fight. Some of my players got a bunch of great effects because they kept trying things and it kept working out well, and some of them, well, didn't work out quite as well. The way this room is completed or exited, four pages from a book of conjuration have to be placed simultaneously in all four wells. The power of those four conjuration pages 
will create a dimension door that will appear from which the party can exit and enter the final boss room where the big bad is waiting. In my game, this played out kind of interestingly. One of the players kind of keyed into this immediately and had that thought of conjuration, door, we should do something with those pages, but the table RP'd it out where some players or some characters didn't want to do that. It ended up being revealed in game in story when one of the players triggered a divination spell causing a massive glowing eye to appear that they could target to look at any creature that they knew. Of course, they targeted it on the big bad. And what they saw was that big bad boss mat in this exact same room, but on a different plane of existence. And that kind of made them clue in that when they crossed into this room, they had gone into some other dimension or other plane, and this room sort of floated in space and time. And they saw him, the big bad, going around and doing this ritual of dropping the pages in and gaining all these interesting effects and basically powering up to defeat them should they come looking. And the great thing is I was able to then use that as a way to show them how to unlock the room because this big bad had some of his skeleton minions with him. And when he was done, he had them go flank the four wells, drop in the pages from the conjuration book, open the door and leave. And of course, the party followed suit, did that exact same thing, created the door, and then were able to go to face him in the final showdown. Overall, I was really happy with how this room played out. Whenever you try to design a puzzle room like this, it rarely works out in reality how you imagine it in your game prep, and often these types of puzzles can play out awkwardly or frustratingly or at worst, really boring. This one, luckily, played out really well. I think it's unique enough, there's enough odd things going on, and there's enough randomness uh, to actually make it dynamic and interesting, and there's enough positive effects from exploration to entice the players to actually get into it and try different things rather than just trying to get out of the room. I would encourage you to try something like this. Like I said, the nice thing is you can use any terrain to represent this stuff. Hell, use Jenga blocks for the bookcases, use bottle caps for the well. It doesn't matter. It's more the concept that is important. Just run with it. Go through your player's handbook, pick spells that you find interesting that are in theme maybe with your world that might be good or really bad for your particular party. Make your roll tables. I only made four of each, but if you wanna make 10 whatever, go nuts. Make as many as you want. Have fun with it. I think it could be an interesting encounter in your game. I hope you enjoyed this video, guys. I know it's a little bit different than usual, and some of you are only here to see me build stuff, but I also know that a ton of you are really interested in my own games, and while I don't record or stream my games, I think this is a nice little insight into one encounter in one of my sessions. Let me know what you thought of this style of video, if it's something that you would like me to do semi-regularly, and let me know what you think of this encounter itself. And most importantly, if you happen to run this at your table, I'd love to see how it plays out and how it landed with your players. Hit that like button if you enjoyed this video, guys. Cheers. I will see you again next week. Oh, one more thing. My session notes for this room, I think, are kind of interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some photos of this and I'm going to put them up on my Patreon to give a little bonus content to my Patreon viewers. So you guys, check it out. It'll be a separate post there if you wanna see how I made notes for this crazy encounter. Peace.